Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our MS activists. We're so pleased to have you join us here today for our workshop, The Power of Storytelling for MS Activists. And you can see that I'm joined by Congresswoman Lori Trahan here, who's on camera. Um, uh, I'm gonna get us started by reading our mission statement, which is, oh, sorry, I'm gonna do the uh, webinar logistics first. Um, okay, so we are using Zoom webinar for today's discussion. Everyone is currently on mute, but when we break for questions, you can use the raise hand button and we'll unmute you to ask your question out loud, um, or you can type your question into the Q&A box and we might read it. Uh, we're gonna be recording today's webinar and we'll share it with all of those who are registered if, in case they were not able to attend or if it's helpful to replay parts of the discussion. And now I'm gonna meet, uh, read through our mission statement. We like to start all of our meetings uh, by reading through this. Our mission statement is, we will cure MS while empowering people affected by MS to live their best lives. We also read through our diversity, equity, and inclusion statement to ground ourselves in our shared values. Um, our uh, DE&I statement is, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society is a movement by and for all people affected by MS. Our voices and actions reflect diversity, equity, and inclusion. We welcome and value diverse perspectives. We actively seek out and embrace differences. And we want everyone to feel respected and be empowered to bring their whole selves to ensure we make the best decisions to achieve our mission. And this uh, statement feels particularly meaningful today in the context of our webinar related to the importance of everyone sharing their story because there's so much value in our elected leaders hearing from a wide array of people representing diverse perspectives. So uh, I am pleased to uh, introduce the representative uh, and, and representative, I don't think I introduced myself to you. I am Stephanie Stern. I'm the vice president of advocacy for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Um, so uh, uh, I'm gonna read your, through your bio so we can, uh, we can all be aware of your incredible accomplishments. Um, so Congresswoman Laura Trahan proudly serves Massachusetts third district. Uh, growing up in a working family, Representative Tran learned the uh, principles of sacrifice, hard work, and grit. Her father was a union iron worker and mother a domestic worker um, who juggled several part-time jobs while raising Lori and her three sisters. Like many, Representative Tran was introduced to public service as a college student in Washington, DC. And after college, she joined Congressman Marty Meehan's staff working her way up to, to become the chief. Uh, she successfully ran for Congress in 2018, was sworn in alongside a historically diverse class of new members, and then immediately got to work for the people of the third district of Massachusetts. Now she's a member of the um, powerful House Energy and Commerce Committee and an advocate for uh, the residents of her district, uh, working to expand access to affordable quality health care, tackle climate change, protect kids online, fight disinformation, and so much more. So thank you for being with us. It's an honor to have you here today. Oh, well, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, really appreciate you all having me. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be with all of you tuning in uh, for this wonderful event today. Uh, first, I just wanted to commend all of you uh, for your incredible work uh, and your tenacious advocacy on behalf of MS patients. I don't have to tell you all that MS is an unpredictable, uh, and debilitating disease and that symptoms can vary widely from person to person. And the MS Society's vision, a world free of MS, is one I share. And your mission uh, is to cure MS while empowering people who are affected by MS to live their best lives is noble and it's necessary. So speaking with you today, I can assure you uh, that we're committed to this work in Washington too. Uh, you know, President Biden's Build Back Better Act takes serious, concrete steps to ensure Americans, including Americans who are living with MS, can afford their prescription drugs by finally giving Medicare the power to negotiate drug prices. It also includes significant investments for people with disabilities to achieve independent living, economic self-sufficiency, and full participation in the workforce and in our communities. This includes investments in the caregiving economy, which will expand access to long-term services and support for individuals with MS. 
It includes uh, a phase out of sub minimum wages, uh, as well as paid leave that supports all of our families. Finally, it includes investments to expand access to competitive, integrated employment opportunities for workers with disabilities. So I am so proud to support these initiatives and I'm always um, will be committed to partner with you uh, in your mission in, in Washington. So I'm, I'm so grateful for all the work that the society does to advance this important cause. And I wish you all the best in, in your efforts. So I look forward to today's discussion and I wanna leave plenty of time uh, for Q and A. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave it there. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, the National MS Society, we are supportive of several of the provisions of the Build Back Better Act and just really appreciate you championing those issues, including access to prescription drugs. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna uh, go right into some questions um, to guide our conversation. And then later we will open it up to the audience for a few questions. So just to start off, um, I understand you have a personal connection to MS and there are a lot of activists today who are joining us and are interested in hearing about that connection, if you're okay talking about it. So um, if you wouldn't mind, can you just talk to us about your personal experience with them? Yes, I'd be delighted to. You know, my so my dad uh, has battled MS for, I don't know, a little over 25 years now. Uh, I know firsthand what it takes for patients and their families to combat this uh, disease. You know, he was diagnosed while I was in college. Mm -hmm. uh, and my dad was, you know, a tall, sturdy man. He was a union iron worker. Uh, and after being misdiagnosed for years, uh, he fell, he fell at work. Um, so in some respects, diagnosis was, was welcome because it gave us clarity on what was wrong. Um, but then of course, you know, the treatments, the clinical trials, uh, the experiments, if you will, ensued. Um, mm -hmm. Through it all, you know, my father has incredible coping mechanisms. Um, he's got this hope and persistence and, and positivity that really does keep my three sisters and me and now his grandchildren, of course, my mom, all very optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that he did do um, it is something that I'm just in awe of. Uh, when patients who have a chronic illness spend their discretionary time advocating for their health and for their community, uh, it really is something special. I mean, my dad used to do the Hill days and the fly-ins in the 90s when I was a staffer uh, on the Hill. And it just left such an impression on me about the power of those stories and the storytelling, mm -hmm. the advocacy, uh, and getting representatives to stop what they're doing uh, and to focus on bills or legislation, policy prescriptions that in some cases can be life-changing uh, for folks. So I do know this fight uh, on a personal level. And, uh, you know, I want, I want you to all know that I'm, I'm in your corner. <laughs> when you're, I'm in your corner. I'll, I always will be on this one. Absolutely. And I just uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, my mom also lives with MS. I know it can be um, emotional to talk about even after many, many years. So yeah. um, it's, but it's so powerful to, to hear those stories, um, which leads me to why we're here today, which, as you mentioned, um, just how important it is for MS activists to share their stories and then connect those stories to the need for action when they're meeting with their legislators. So as a member of Congress, can you just talk to us about what it means to you to hear those firsthand accounts from the constituents in your district about, you know, whatever issues are important to them? Yeah, so it's everything uh, in a nutshell. I mean, one of the, the most important and most valuable parts of my job is when I'm able to hear firsthand accounts from um, my constituents on uh, on why issues are important to them and how policy can change you know can change their lives. I mean, it th I think it's easy for a lot of people to come to Washington and lose touch uh, with the district and the families that they represent. But uh, I've made it you know my mission to never allow that to happen uh, to our team. And so even when we're working on big policy packages like the bipartisan infrastructure bill or the Build Back Better Act, we're always finding ways to communicate how it's going to improve the lives of a family in my hometown of Lowell or a union member in Fitchburg or a working mom who's taking care of her elderly father at home. Um, but I think it's really important that 
you know, you, you remind yourself that in order to do that, you have to listen. Uh, and hearing those stories from my constituents empower me uh, to make sure that final legislation represents their priorities. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, it also makes the work that much more meaningful and rewarding to me and everyone you know, I get to work with on my team. So that's the reason why I, I love this work so much. It's the reason mm -hmm. why I decided to run for Congress. I mean, every day I, I get the opportunity to make a difference for, for real people uh, across mm -hmm. Massachusetts third district um, by hearing those stories. So um, it's a big part of this process. Thank you. Um, so I have a, a follow up question. Uh, so you're, you know, you're one of our strongest allies. So um, you have been really receptive to a lot of what we've had to say. Um, but mm -hmm. I'm just curious, you know, just in other circumstances, any circumstances, have have constituent stories ever motivated you to think differently or act differently about a policy issue? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, it just gives you a real life lens uh, into, a, you know, a firsthand account. You know, I. Look, I came to Washington in 2019 to deliver for, uh, you know, families like the one I grew up in. Um, now I'm a member of the health subcommittee and the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and I've, I've had the opportunity to support policies that work to lower pres prescription drug uh, costs, close health uh, care coverage gaps, um, invest in public health infrastructure, and improve our our pandemic response. Um, and the conversations that I have with my constituents drive the point home on why fixing our broken healthcare system is so important. You know, I remember when HR3, the Lower Drug Costs uh, Now Act, first passed the House in 2019. You know, I, I, I actually spoke to one of my constituents, Mary Garcia, who is an, an MS patient herself. And she explained to me that she has paid hundreds of thousands of dollars out of pocket to afford her mm -hmm. prescription drugs to treat her MS. And I've heard from constituents who have had to cut back on their prescriptions to stretch out their doses just to be able to make ends meet. Uh, you know, it's unacceptable. And not, not one American in the wealthiest nation in the world should have to cut back on life-saving uh, medications in order to put food on their you know, family's table. I'll, I'll tell you just a recent example because it, it, it just happened. I had a, a, a really moving conversation with an ALS patient, uh, mm -hmm. Kathy, who is tenacious in her advocacy, even as she looks down uh, at a really tough journey ahead um, to get the Act for ALS Act passed. And for those mm -hmm. of you who don't know that that legislation will increase access to clinical trial treatments for ALS patients. My conversation with Kathy just it's it reinforced the need to pass critical pieces of legislation that increase access to care for patients. And uh, you know, I'm happy to say today that Act for ALS is getting marked up in the Energy and Commerce Committee. I'll soon be joining my colleagues to send it to the House floor for full passage. So I say all that because your stories, all of your stories, have only reinforced for me and for so many others why we came to Washington in the first place. Thank you so much. Um, so, I, you know, just switching gears just a little bit. Um, so we encourage uh, the MS activists to meet with their legislators virtually or in person, but we also encourage them to reach out by email and email their elected officials about specific policy issues. And we help them to prepare the, the text, but we also encourage them to personalize their message, make it their own, uh, and add their own story about how the issue affects them and their families. Mm -hmm. uh, because we know that makes the email more effective for the member of Congress. Um, can you talk about how your um, how your office responds to email and and how important that is to um, for people to reach out via email and include uh, their personal story when they're oh. sending messages to your office? Sure. Um, everybody has their own relationship to constituent services. You know, I certainly have formed my team with the intention uh, the intention of letting folks know um, that constituent services are, is our number one priority. Uh, every single message that comes in is important. Um, and I always enjoy reading personal anecdotes uh, that are included. Oftentimes I incorporate them immediately into my remarks um, because they're the most compelling uh, stories or arguments in making a case. So I think your stories reinforce um, these big policy pieces uh, mm -hmm. that in it, in it makes it so relatable for, you know, 
people as we as we shift public opinion when we're making the case for say build the build back better act we always anchor to those stories in mm-hmm. shifting public opinion because you know people can understand they can understand a story from their neighbor or someone in their community much more than they can sort of um uh, you know, understand maybe like the top line numbers or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some of the, the rhetoric that's, you know, come playing out on, on the airwaves. Um, so I will say that, you know, hearing those stories, whether it's an email or over the phone, uh, many times you will hear them come right out of your representative's mouths because they're the most compelling arguments that we make to folks. That's a great example of the power of a, an individual story. I'm so glad that you are using stories in that way. Um, so in addition to emails and the meetings, we encourage our activists to use social media. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your office uses social media and how our MS activists can effectively reach your office or you know, their members of Congress on social media? Yeah, absolutely. So I am... Um, uh, I am one of social media's uh, largest critics uh, because I've, I've sort of seen when their hands are on the controls and targeting certain uh, pieces of content or advertising to keep people on their platforms longer, that it can it can go sideways real fast. And we've seen some examples of that in the last 18 months. That being said, we can never forget the power um, that is uh, that is at our fingertips with these social media platforms. I think of just during COVID uh, in these last 18 months, we were able to interact with our constituents, um, get them information, truthful, uh, medical experts, you know, so when people had questions, right, they wanted to know how can I keep my family and my, um, my community safe, and they just wanted to uh, to get that information, that accurate information. And so mm-hmm. I think it serves as a convenient way for people to share their stories, of course, to, mm-hmm. and to just increase the reach of, of who hears those stories. So I think it's really important to utilize social media. We do it all the time. Uh, we mm-hmm. not only use it to interact with our with our constituents and to um, and get information to them, but we also use it as a way for them to contact us. Uh, everybody has a handle on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram because that's just another means for people to get in touch with us and share uh, whatever concerns or priorities that they have for us to take up in Washington. So. I, uh, I, I I get a lot of meetings, direct uh, messages um, through social media, and they're you know they're personalized and they're confidential. We treat them the same exact way we do an email that would come to our office or a letter, and um, and I think all offices are kind of operating um, that way. So definitely use whatever means is most comfortable for you to get in touch with us. Uh, thank you. That's a, those are all great examples of social media, using social media as a tool. Um, so I'll, have, I'll ask you one more question and then we'll open it up uh, to a couple of questions um, from our audience. And my, my last question is just, what would you say to an activist who might think that their story doesn't matter or won't make a difference? Oh, well, I guess I would just first say that it couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, There are, what, 535 members of the House and the Senate, and each one of us has uh, a unique experience uh, and a background story. And so many of us have gone through things that many, you know, could never imagine. And what often cuts through the noise uh, the most, I mean, is the stories like yours, stories that people who have experienced, um, you know, severe illness of a loved one, uh, severe illness to yourself, those are so relatable. I mean, I'm one of those members. I know a lot of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle are too. Uh, I, I know what we talk about when we're in the halls and it's like, how can we get our acts together to pass legislation? Because we've both heard similar stories from the people we represent. So I get that it's easy to feel like maybe your voice doesn't matter, especially when you turn on the TV and you see sort of a device of Washington. Um, but I can assure you um, that our team and many teams uh, on the Hill, they read every single message that that's sent to us. We take hundreds of meetings with groups like this one every month. And I would point, you know, once again, to the example I used before for the Act for ALS Act. The ALS Mm -hmm. community has fought 
tooth and nail to pass this needed legislation. And today we're one step closer to its final passage. Uh, American workers have organized and called out to their representatives to finally give hardworking Americans paid family leave. And today we're one step closer to passing the Build Back Better agenda with four weeks of paid family leave. Mm -hmm. And I think those are just a couple of examples, but um, keep, keep doing uh, what you're doing. The only thing that can actually move others is, is your story. We absolutely love hearing that and really appreciate you you're sharing that perspective with us. Um, okay, so now I will invite Anna to uh, let us know if there are questions for the representative. Yeah, we've been getting a few um, messages. The first thing I want to share is that there are a few MS activists on the call today from Massachusetts who remember working with your dad as an oh. MS activist and volunteering with them. So Helen and JR both wanted to say hi to your dad oh. about, um, and let you know oh. that connection. I, you know, I, I went to a couple of MS meetings with my, with my father, but if there is anybody um, who actually did the Hill days with my dad, I know before my father got his um, electric scooter, um, there was a group of women, no less, of course, it's always women who like pushed him in the, you know, old school wheelchair, through, oh, wow. and, you know, over the, the campus. And uh, I'll never forget seeing th their, them. Uh, and after a very long day, I'm like, oh my gosh, dad, you should have called me. I would have come outside to walk you around the hill. But it's just, it's just, goes to show the persistence and the, the commitment mm -hmm. to the advocacy that those women had pushing my, pushing my dad from office to office. So thank you if you're out there. Wow, that's incredible. I didn't know you had that experience. We're so, that's so great to hear. Um, Anna, what, uh, what else do we have? I think we have time for just one more. So people want to know, you know, what we're doing most of our advocacy from home and we're not able to do a lot of in-person connections with legislators. So if you have just one tip to share, to make our stories heard and have the biggest impact, what would that be? So I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question part of it. Was it the, the Zoom and getting together with folks virtually? So it sounded like, Anna was cutting out a little bit, but it sounded like we're doing all of our meetings virtually. Is there, a, what tip would you have to make those virtual meetings most effective, I think? I have to say, I, I think we've all gotten used to Zoom in, in the last year, 18 months, right? I mean, we've all gotten really good at it and, and we've all gotten comfortable with it. We've sort of been able to replicate what happens in person in our offices virtually. So look, it's huge, right? You could actually have more meetings. You can actually meet with more people um, as a result of us, you know, taking uh, a, a bigger share of virtual meetings. And there is no, there is no difference in terms of the urgency or the power of that story happening virtually. When I can see you, and I can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hear uh, your you know, your own personal um, anecdotes than if you were sitting in my office. So mm -hmm. I think um, keep scheduling those. If anything, you know, you can actually have more of an impact because you can probably do more uh, without having to do the hard part, like the travel mm -hmm. and, the, you know, the moving around uh, campus. And so I think that's here to stay. Uh, so make sure your camera's on, <laughs> make sure that you get that amount of time that you so deserve with your representative uh, and make sure you're just sharing the, the most compelling parts of why they need to focus on advancing legislation that's going to help you. Thank you so much. That couldn't couldn't end on a better note. Um, Congresswoman, I think if, if we were to unmute everyone's line, we would be hearing a, a round of applause for you. We really appreciate your time. Your time. We know you're so busy. Um, and thank you for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you all. And hopefully, hopefully at some point soon we will be able to convene in person. <laughs> yes, fingers crossed. All right. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. And Bye -bye. Now, thank you. Uh, and now I am turning it over to our AVP of Advocacy and Activist Engagement, Holly Pendle. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you so much, Representative Trahan. We were actually hearing from our staff that she's going to run off to, for a few votes, so we're so sorry we couldn't take more questions, but we're so thankful for her time and for being with us today. As Stephanie mentioned, I'm Holly Pendel, the Associate VP of Advocacy and Activist Engagement. And we're so glad that you could all be with us today. We're actually going to kick it off with a little bit of a poll. 
um, to kind of get you thinking about stories and how they can be most effective. So um, hopefully a poll is popping up and it says, uh, which of these stories do you think is the most effective? So if everyone will just take a second and answer that question and then we'll see what the answers say. Okay. Oh, and it looks like everybody has the right idea about that. So on average, um, people with MS and Medicare spend over 6,000 out of pocket just for MS DMTs alone every single year. So that's a large amount and certainly gives a lot of information and is more effective than the first one that simply mentions that they're expensive. So good job there. Okay. So I just wanna to talk to you a little bit today about stories. Um, your story is authentically yours and so powerful. It adds so much to the society's advocacy efforts for you to personally reflect on your experiences when you speak to legislators about policy issues that are important to you and to the society and all people living with MS. In fact, they say that messages that are delivered as stories are 22 times more memorable than just the facts alone. So many of you have already written out your stories and a lot of you had even, have even had the opportunity to share your stories with legislators already. But so many of you are, are newer activists and are just beginning to put your stories together. So we wanted to just review a few things to keep in mind when you're doing that. We know that the most impactful stories are stories that create a picture in people's minds and engage our emotions. So consider that when you think about your stories and when you're writing your stories. For a lot of MS activists, um, their stories might be set in a doctor's office when they first um, received their diagnosis or maybe the first time they felt their symptoms. Um, for one of my activists, uh, she tells the story about having to share her diagnosis with her manager for the first time. Her manager was actually an owner of several upscale upscale restaurants in our area. And she was so intimidated to have to share with him her diagnosis, so nervous. And she talks about her fears going into his office for the first time. He's a really big burly man. And she just wasn't sure that he was even familiar with MS. And she was worried that he wouldn't, be, he wouldn't believe that she could um, do her job any longer, just so intimidated by the idea of sharing this. And um, he, he reached across the desk and, and embraced her. And he simply said, you know, we're just gonna have to find a cure. And um, ever since that, he's been a dedicated donor to the society and even attended our action day several times. So that story and so many others can invect, um, invoke images and emotions that leave lasting impressions with people and um, can truly make an impact. So think about that when you're considering your the stories that you write and the stories that you tell. Finally, timing does matter. So short but sweet is not a cliche, it's really true. Consider just telling your story in just a few short minutes. Sometimes that's all we have, but also that's more impactful. Um, so two to three minutes for an in-person meeting, but when sending an email like we're going to be doing today, just a short paragraph is all that you need. So next we're going to have another poll as we kind of kick off um, our discussion about well, how now? So hopefully another poll will pop up there. Yeah. So we're just kind of looking for some feedback. Have you ever shared your wow with an elected official? So I wanna kind of see how many people we have today that have shared their wow. Have you shared it by email, phone, in person, virtually? Let's see what we've got. Give everyone a minute. Okay, so wow, a lot of you have shared your wow in person. That's fabulous. And a lot by email. Oh, but great. So there's like a quarter of you that haven't had opportunity to shout, share your wow yet. So that is coming today. You're gonna have your chance. Um, as we heard from Representative Trey Hand, stories are powerful tools in advocacy. When we're asking our leaders to support our policy positions, stories are the most important part. Stories are how we build our connections, how we remember people, and how we gain empathy and support for our policy issues. We can share, as staff, we can share 
um, statistics and facts all day, but people remember your stories. Legislators remember you and the stories that you share. At the MS Society, we use a tool called Wow How Now to structure the conversations around our stories and the policies that we support. The now is the, sp the specific po policy act. So it's going to be something like vote yes on this bill. It's short, it's straightforward. It's something that we're always going to provide to you. The how is just that. That's gonna be how does the policy work? Um, how um, can we, how will that policy make a difference in the lives of people with MS? And it's going to explain how the policy would make a difference. And sometimes it might be a little bit policy wonky. So we're going to always help you with that. And it might include a few facts or figures um, or some specific information that the legislator might appreciate. And we're gonna provide that how to. Sometimes we'll provide you a few choices for your how that you can choose from that might seem more significant for you. Um, but the wow, that's what's really most important. And that's how we kick off our conversation. And that's where you come in. The wow is the why. It's why is the policy important? It's your story. It's what's um, how that policy is going to work for you or how it could work for you if you are impacted by it in the future. And the wow can be adapted into your story or be added depending on the amount of time that you have to tell your story. So sometimes activists aren't necessarily personally impacted about a subject. Um, but what I like to tell them is that by having impact, you by having MS, you're always being impacted. And you can always speak for others who will be impacted or are able or are currently impacted. And that's why during um, our public policy conference or state action days, we're always going to share the stories of other people living with MS who are impacted. So you can always share that you know someone's specific story, or sometimes people will say, well, you know, I'm really fortunate. I have um, really good healthcare insurance right now. And that's wonderful. And we're so glad that you do. But so often you can say, you know, without my healthcare insurance, my medication might be 60, 80, $100,000 a year. And that's an impactful story to share that you wouldn't know what you would do without that insurance. And that many people living with MS um, are, are have that experience every day. There's always the story to share and we're always going to help you with that. I wanted to take the opportunity to share with you some ways that our MS act activists have been impactful. So you'll see on the screen from left to right, some of our activists featured today. So that first message there is actually um, a story from uh, U.S. Representative Tlaib, and she's sharing a message on um, social media with our MS activist, Lisa McRipley from Michigan. And they're talking about um, Lisa's story about her high cost of um, prescription drug pricing. And Representative Tlaib shared that in a House committee hearing on the issue. And she reached out to Lisa ahead of time. Lisa had shared her story with her during our public policy conference and this hearing was coming up and the office reached out and said, Lisa, we'd really, you know, we wanna be able to share a story from back in the district during this committee. And we know you had this experience, would it be okay for the representative to share your story? And they spoke one-on-one -on -one, and um, it was a really impactful story told um, during the committee hearing. And Lisa was so happy to be able to have her story told and to be able to help the representative support this issue. The next picture is of Therese Humphrey Ball of Indiana, who was asked to actually testify before the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. And she also was able to share her story on drug pricing reform. Well, actually that's the one on the furthest to the right. That's Therese. And then there in the middle is Diane Whitcraft of Wisconsin. And Diane had the honor of attending the State of the Union, including um, several press events with US Senator Tammy Baldwin. And she too shared her drug pricing story. So, so often these stories are incredibly impactful and so helpful to our representatives and senators in Washington um, to be able to really magnify the policy issues that are important to people with MS. Your stories truly resonate with lawmakers and they do make an impact. Now, I'm so excited to share with you today, firsthand, a couple of our MS activists who have agreed to share their stories. 
So first up, we have Erica Wyatt. Erica is the safety officer, and she is also an MS Society district activist leader in Georgia. Erica received her bachelor's from Alabama Agriculture and Mechanical University and her MBA from Keller Graduate School of Government. And today, Erica, um, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to have you share your story and um, just give everyone an opportunity to hear from you directly. Erica? Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about why I share um, my journey with MS to advocate. Uh, my journey with MS started June 2018 with what I thought was going to be a simple visit to the ER. A few months later, I had an official MS diagnosis. And like so many people, I was learning how to live with the highs and lows that come from having MS. Like so many people, I also learned what it was like to receive a surprise medical bill in the mail. This was from a doctor that saw me in the chaos of the ER that I don't recall seeing, but I was still responsible for paying this sizable bill. So I advocated to end surprise medical billing because when you're dealing with a life-changing medical diagnosis, the last thing you also wanna deal with is a sudden financial crisis. I also share the story of when I think back of the day I got off a plane, um, it was for a work trip, I turned my phone on and I had a message from the specialty pharmacy telling me that my work insurance would no longer fully cover the cost of my first DMT. Uh, they did tell me that I could reach out to the pharmaceutical company to see if I could be placed in a financial assistance program. So I'm on the phone with the pharmaceutical company in the airport because I wasn't gonna leave the airport until I had clarity on this. Because like so many people, I'm thinking, how can I already, how can I juggle an already tight budget to afford the extra, I think they told me like a thousand plus dollars a month for this DMT. Because we all know MS meds are some of the most expensive medications out there. Now, thankfully for me, I was able to get in the financial program uh, to cover the cost of this DMT but I still advocate for affordable MS medication because just in that quick minute, I could have been like so many other people living with MS who have to choose between their MS medication and paying the bills. So in conclusion, I like sharing my journey with MS to advocate for what people can call total quality healthcare and it includes transparency when it comes to pricing for uh, medical costs that would end surprise medical billing that includes making sure MS medication is affordable for everyone. So no one would have to be in a situation of having to choose between their MS medication and putting food on the table. Because at the end of the day, we all deserve quality healthcare. And that includes access to healthcare that is affordable and of good quality. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Erica. I'm so glad that you could join us today. And if you don't mind, I thought it might be fun if you could share maybe one of your most positive or fun experiences that you've had as an MS activist. Sure. Um, I would say my first, um, well, there's two really quick. The first August recess meeting that I had, um, and I'll tell all the new uh, advocates out there, yes, I was very nervous because I was going to meet with my U.S. congressman, um, first time ever having to do that. But it was great having support from two other advocates from the society there to help guide me along. And it was a great conversation. It turned into more of a conversation than a formal meeting. And he was so interested in hearing our stories of MS and being supportive of what we wanted him to um, support in Congress. And also my first PPC, uh, once again, having that before everything shut down, having that experience of actually meeting face to face with Georgia um, senators and Congress people to talk about MS legislation, things that we want to pass. So that was a great experience. So I would just tell everyone, please share your stories. They could be great conversation pieces to get the support that we need here at the society. I love when those meetings just turn into like comfy conversations. That's the best. That's exactly how we want them to be. I'm glad you had that experience. And next up, we have Ryan McReynolds. Ryan's a consultant with a software company and an MS district activist leader in Massachusetts and on the Government Relations Advisory Committee. Um, Ryan earned his Bachelor's of Science from Auburn and his MBA from the University of Oregon. Ryan, thanks so much for being here today. Do you wanna share your story now with us? 
Uh, sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Hi, everyone. Great. Uh, name's Ryan McReynolds. Uh, so my story, I was actually diagnosed with MS during the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> I was at my in-laws house and woke in the western part of the state and woke up and couldn't really feel my arm or my left leg. <laughs> so thought I was having a stroke. Went to a small ER room uh, down the street from my parents or my in-laws house and uh, nonchalantly, they did a CAT scan. They came in, they're like, you're not having a stroke. Uh, we think you might have MS. You should talk to your primary care physician and discharge me. So <laughs> I had an inkling that that's what I had. Uh, got back home to the Boston area and uh, saw my primary care who referred me to a neurologist. Uh, went in for a couple of MRIs. And uh, yeah, sure enough, it was diagnosed that I had uh, MS. So that was my diagnosis. Uh, I've been pretty fortunate in that um, I don't have severe symptoms. I have some and I've recognized things that occur now that I never would have thought were MS symptoms that in fact are. Uh, occasionally I have some balance issues and stuff like that. I always just thought I was clumsy, probably not the case. At any rate, uh, so what I really, the reason I like to advocate is and an experience I recently had is I changed jobs uh, about eight months ago. And one of my big concerns was my insurance coverage. I had excellent coverage at my last job and uh, they covered my MS medication in full. And my concern going to this new company, while it was professionally a great opportunity, I, I didn't know if insurance was gonna make it feasible. My medication without insurance is over $6,000 a month. Uh, luckily, I was able to find a plan that they offered, but it was more out of pocket uh, in terms of what I had to pay for my premium. Uh, my my medicine's still covered, but so essentially the reason I advocate, I, I understand that I'm very fortunate and I'm in a really great spot. Uh, I've been pretty lucky. A lot of people aren't. Uh, I don't think it's fair to diagnose someone with an illness and then tell them your treatment an effective treatment is $6,000 a month. And hey, your insurance doesn't cover that. Uh, I don't think that's fair. Frankly, I don't think it's right. <laughs> I will say one thing. Uh, this diagnosis has definitely made me significantly more empathetic <laughs> to people. So, uh, but yeah, so the reason I really do this is, uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I've i seen people that are far more greatly impacted by their diagnosis than me, who don't have the means to pay for treatment. And I just don't think that's right. And so uh, I wanna do what I can to change that. So, thank yeah, you. Ryan, <laughs> I think, yeah, that's really a unique experience, I think, getting diagnosed during COVID and having um, so many experiences you shared with me be virtual. Um, I wanted to ask you the same experience, the same question about, you know, your experience as an MS activist and which have kind of stood out in your mind, although I bet they're all virtual. Can you tell me about yeah. your best <laughs> yeah. MS experience? Yeah, so my best was actually with uh, State Representative Carmine Gentile. Uh, all have been great. I've had great experiences. I feel like Everyone I've spoken to has been receptive and inquisitive uh, and wanted to listen. Uh, but uh, Senator Carmine, uh, he's my local senator here in the state. And we just had a lot of, we, we frequented some of the same places, like the same restaurant. So it, it really genuinely, half of our conversation was just a great chat. And at the end, he was like, if you ever need anything, like, you know, not related to this, anything, just reach out. So uh, yeah, that was a really good experience. So um Oftentimes, I think we can look at politicians and, you know, they don't know us like, to presume that like they, it, it, so it's great, but I felt like he genuinely cared, which, you know, uh, when you're representing thousands to millions of people, uh, I think it's great to put a face with it and uh, so that they know that like these are what their constituents are going through and the things that are important to us. So that was a great experience though. I, I felt, you know, it, it was just a nice chat, so. No, I think that's a great point, right? Like they're human too, and we can really build relationships with them. And it sounds like you're off to a great start with him. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I wanna thank Erica and Ryan again. That's not easy to kind of stand up before a few hundred people and share your story. And I'm so thankful that they both were willing to do so today, thanks to both of you. So we've shared a little bit about, about storytelling and creating your story today. And now we're gonna give you an opportunity to um, create your story and share it today. So I'm happy to introduce to you Leslie Ritter, our Associate Vice President of Federal Government Relations. Leslie's gonna tell you more about the policy we're gonna talk about today and that we're gonna have an opportunity to take action on and share a little bit of our stories. 
Leslie. Thanks, Holly. And um, before I jump in, I really wanted to thank Ryan and Erica because that was just so on point and just so relevant. Um, everyone's story is impactful in a very different way. And I think you both did a fa fabulous job at showing just um, bringing your personalities and, and showing how much impact you've made. So thank you so much. Um, so as Holly said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the policy issue that you'll be responding to today in your action alert. Um, and the Congress one really set this up um, and made my job super easy for me. Um, so one of the action alert will talk about the Build Back Better Act, which is HR 5376. You've likely heard this talked about as the Build Back Better Act. You may have heard it talk, um, talked about in the news media as a budget reconciliation bill or President Biden's domestic legislative agenda. But just know that all those terms are used to really talk about one bill, and that's the Build Back Better Act. So um, as the Congresswoman said, there are several provisions of the bill um, that we believe would benefit people affected by MS, um, particularly around um, policies and provisions to address the high cost of prescription drugs. Um, you heard her reference um, a couple of times that there is provisions that would um, implement a national four-week paid leave program, which would be really help um, people living with MS and their families and their caregivers um, be able to access this kind of leave policy. Um, there is also provisions that would expand access to quality, affordable health care and home and community based services, some of those long term services and supports that we know are so important. So a little bit of timing and why we're asking you to act now. Um, as you heard the Congresswoman say, it's a very busy week. Um, the House of Representatives is expected to vote eminently on the bill. We don't know whether that will be today, tomorrow perhaps Friday, but we do know that they're planning on voting this week on the bill. So getting your stories to them um, this week really puts them in a position to be able to utilize those to talk about why the bill is so important. The bill will then move to the Senate where changes are expected. And it's really good timing now because you will utilize your story to tell your senators which of the provisions are most impactful to you and why it is important that those provisions stay in the bill as they take it when the House passes it this week. So going on to the next slide. Great, thanks. Um, so here you'll see um, what kind of what the action alert is going to look like. So if you take out your phone or your device and you text powerful MS stories to 52886, and I'll repeat that. So text powerful MS stories, all one word, to 52886. And you can take action now and you'll get access to this action alert and um, be able to personalize it and fill it out with your information. So here's your chance. Um, once you get that action alert, um, we, we will need you to reach out to your members of Congress today. So if you've done an action alert before um, or you've responded to an action alert before from the society, you may notice that this looks a little different. In each of the action alerts that um, are sent out, you have the option to personalize your message in a little um, in the the area um, in a box that is that says you have the option to personalize. Well, today is a little different because today we're focused on storytelling. So in the little box that says share how the Build Back Better Act would impact your life, you will be required um, to fill that in before you can press send email. So that is really your opportunity to take the key messages about why the Build Back Better Act is important and talk about what, what provisions and what parts of the bill would impact you the most. So let's talk a little bit about what that could look like. You heard the Congresswoman talk about some of the Medicare changes that are in the Build Back Better Act. So if you're a Medicare beneficiary, um, this bill could really help improve the affordability of your medications um, in a couple of different ways. It would allow Medicare to neg directly negotiate the cost of a certain number of drugs. So your treatment and um, your DMT could be um, some of those, those treatments that are negotiated for a lower price. Um, the bill would also implement an out-of-pocket cap that would limit those out-of-pocket expenses to $2,000 per year and allow those costs to be spread over the course of the plan year. So if you're a Medicare beneficiary, it can really help improve your out-of-pocket costs that way. If you're on an MS disease modifying therapy, a really important point is the bill includes an inflationary rebate, meaning 
that the prescription drug manufacturers would be limited to how much they could raise the cost of that drug in the next year. So we know in the past, over the past five years, there's been five MS DMTs that have had their prices increased over 30%. And so the Build Back Better Act would help put an end to that practice. We know that MS is an dis expensive disease to manage both from um, an expense, a personal expense. We know the impact it has on family and caregivers. So if you, um, you know, you may relate to the paid family and medical leave provision that would allow people to take up to four weeks to either seek treatment for themselves um, for the, a family member to provide care for a sick child. I think the pandemic has all shown us how, how much that flexibility benefits people. So this was an important provision that you could reference if that's important to you. And one of the things that um, the Congresswoman talked about a little bit was just the, um, the bill providing funding for those long-term supports and services. So um, providing money for those home and community-based services, which allow people affected by MS to remain independent and avoid premature admissions to nursing home facilities or other kind of facilities. So as it currently stands, those services are an optional benefit in some of the state Medicaid programs. So access to something like a rehabilitation service may or not may not be available in the state. And so this bill would provide funding to increase the amount of home and community based services to states. So states could offer more services if they chose. So I if you are so working on your alert, um, I can pause here. We can have some questions. If you have questions around the Build Back Better Act, if you have questions around um, the alert or working through the alert, I think we can all come up and, and um, take your questions now. I think some of you asked for the um, link and Anna's gonna put that in the chat as well. It was just added. Should be able to see it now. So great to see everyone chatting. I love that. So are, are we, do we have any questions? Um, Anna, do you see any hands raised or chat que uh, questions in the chat box? Yeah, we've been getting a lot of really good questions this entire time. Um, one that I wanted to address for sure was, um, maybe Holly could respond to this, but what do you do if you are trying to share a story but you haven't been personally impacted by the policy? Do you have any tips for that? Sure, I think there's a few things. Um, living with MS, there's always that what if scenario. So you could say, um, you could consider that scenario and share it. So for instance, with the high cost of prescription drugs, if, um, if you're currently benefiting from really great insurance, you could say, um, you know, if I lost my insurance, I don't know what I would do if I had to pay, for instance, in Ryan's situation, $6,000 a month. I don't know how my family would incur that cost. Um, and you could also say, you know, I'm sharing this for many other people living with MS who face this challenge every day. Um, and that would be completely fair to say, because everything that we advocate for people with MS are facing um, on, a, on a daily basis. Fantastic. Um, we also have a couple of policy questions. Um, someone asked if the policy is only for Medicare or will it affect those with private insurance as well? So the, um, the out-of-pocket cap and the smoothing mechanism are only in Medicare. Um, and the uh, negotiation would only impact um, Medicare's ability to negotiate drugs for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, so in terms of those provisions, those are only on Medicare. Now for DMT, um, for anyone who's taking a DMT, um, that the inflationary rebate that's a part of the Build Back Better Act would apply um, broadly. So um, that would, doesn't really matter if you're on private insurance or on um, Medicare. It's just really talking about the list price of those medications. Great, thank you. Uh, we've had a few people ask if there's an easy summary that they can do of the issues in the bill that we are taking a stand on. Um, I'll share some of those are in the action alert link. You can yeah. see those in the email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have some talking points um, and, and facts um, provided in the email. 
uh, or in the action alert um, text. So let um, let us know if you think that is is kind of getting at what you're talking about. Otherwise, you can go to the website um, and the Twitter and the Society's MS Activist Twitter account, and you can find additional details about the Build Back Better Act. All right, we've got a few questions still about the action alert. I'll continue putting the link in the chat so people can access that there in case that is easier. Um, someone else asked specifically about the inflationary standard. Could you touch on that and explain that in a little more detail? Sure, so an inflationary rebate, um, what we've seen in the MS um, DMT drug classes um, every year, the costs are going, the list price of those medications are going up. And sometimes those price increases can be two to 3%. Sometimes those price increases can be 10 to 15%. Um, an inflationary rebate would say that um, a manufacturer could only raise the price of a drug to the, um, to the amount of inflation. So instead of something being a 12% increase, um, like we've seen in the MS class, you, you would be only able to raise that price 6% because that's where the inflation rate is, um, which would greatly benefit um, people who are taking DMTs because we have seen those prices increase pretty substantially. And I think, I, let me know if you need me to go into a little bit more detail. I can get really nerdy about this, but um, I will kind of put myself in check there. I found that very helpful. So thank you. Well, Great. The questions are coming in so fast that I can't read all of them. <laughs> so it'll take me just a second. I saw people were asking if it's all one word. It is. You have to text that all is one word to the number, to that number. Yes. So it's powerful MS stories, all one word. And the capitalization does not matter um, as long as it's one word. I see one really specific question about the five MS medications that have increased. Did we mention which ones they were? No, I didn't mention which ones they were, um, but the actual chart has been um, is on the MS Activist Twitter account. Um, so we can we can retweet that out after the call um, if you want the specific medications. And there was a question, Leslie, about um, if it only impacts the prescription drug um, part only impacts Medicare or if there's any parts that impact anything other than Medicare. Um, <clears throat> So for um, the inflationary rebate, that's that's all DMTs. So that's not specific. So the out-of-pocket cap and the um, Medicare negotiation and the ability to spread out costs over the over the plan here, that's only in Medicare. But there are other provisions in the bill that would uh, help address healthcare affordability and access um, beyond Medicare. Right, right. So there are. Um, there are provisions in the bill that would allow for the tax credits that Congress passed as a part of the COVID relief package that um, if you have an ACA plan, um, an Affordable Care Act plan, it would allow those um, taxes, tax credits to um, be extended to help improve the affordability of those plans. I think there are a few people that have their hands raised, but we're having a hard time unmuting you. Um, please feel free to write your questions in the q and I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I apologize. I can't seem to unmute anybody. <laughs> I'm having the same we, I think we are, are we at time too, Holly? Um, yes, I think we are. So if, if people have to hop off, certainly we understand. I, I'm, we can answer maybe a few more questions as they come in the Q&A because I do feel bad that we haven't been able to unmute folks. We can also put one of our email addresses in the chat for people who want to email us directly uh, their questions. Yeah, let's put the MS activist um, emails in there as well, Anna. Um, uh -huh. I can unmute um, Kyle. I have your hand up. I'll go ahead and press the. You should be able to unmute yourself now. If you want to share your question. Sorry, I was just leaning on the keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I see one question in from, um, do I need to figure out my personal out of 
out of cost expenses before contacting? Um, I don't think you do. I, I actually think you can say I live with MS. I'm on a disease modifying therapy and this is how the bill would help me. Um, I don't think you really need those particulars. If you know them, they're great details to add to the alert, but you don't have to have them before you reach out. I think your personal story is impactful regardless of whether or not you have those details. And again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. There are more, there is more information available on Twitter. You can continue to reach out to us at MS Activist. Um, we're happy to um, answer your questions on that email address. We'll put that in the chat bar. And we're so glad that so many of you were able to join us today. And again, I thank all of the speakers, our MS Activist and Representative Trahan. Um, we're so happy that you joined us and we hope that you'll take action today. Again, we'll post this and we'll send um, a link to the recording out probably tomorrow as we process that recording. We hope that you'll share the alert with your friends and family and um, feel free also to share the recording if you think there are others that'll enjoy it. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks everyone. Thank you.